Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Miche Brooks Rawlings, who is, she's a very diverse woman in the things that she does and the things that she is interested in. And I'm bringing her on today because we were having a really interesting conversation about post-COVID life and her perspectives on it are, they, they were just, they really resonated with me. And I thought that her story would maybe help you. So Miche wears three main hats in her life besides being, you know, having a family and being a woman who is in the world and busy. She has a business called Event Prep. She is the interim director of UMEA, which is the Upstate Minority Economic Alliance. And she has this love and passion for teaching financial literacy. And so she works that into her life too. So you can imagine running her own business, being the interim director of a, um, a minority, what, what is it called? Like a minority, like what do we call Chamber it? of Commerce. Yes, I always lose that word. And also then having this passion project, you can imagine how busy she is. And so I'm going to let her tell her story, but I want you to start thinking about all the hats that you wear and what ahas you've had during COVID that have made you think, what do I need to let go of to really bring myself back to center during this time? So thank you, Miche, for being here. I appreciate your time. And I love this topic that we're talking about. And I hope that that intro kind of gave, uh, gave credence to what you're doing. Did, was I on target there? Absolutely, Jen. First of all, Good morning and thank you for having me. Um, you've been a ray of light in my life ever since I met you earlier this year. So it's an honor to be here this morning. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you. Can you tell us about the three different kind of spokes of your business and your life that I just introduced? Certainly. Just to give your audience a little bit of uh, historical perspective of my journey, uh, my husband and I relocated to Syracuse uh, 13 years ago. I say relocated, but because both of us are uh, Syracuse University alumni, and um, he was recruited by the university as a professor, and um, I pretty much delved in from the moment we relocated. Um, I worked at Syracuse University as staff for 10 years. Um, uh, my first five years um, were as um, uh, Director of Special Events and Public Relations for Disability Institute. Mm -hmm. And my latter five years were as um, director of special events and conferences for Veterans Institute. During my um, decade tenure at SU, I pretty much was a hybrid entrepreneur out the gate. I did events by day, obviously for the university, mm -hmm. but um, I was already the author of a book called How to Save Money and Organize Your Finances, which started during our you know New York City days. And so by the time we relocated here, the book was published. I quickly learned that Syracuse had a strong entrepreneurial um, ecosystem, um, resources regarding how to, you know, um, start and grow one's business enterprise were in abundance. So I would get off at five o'clock, um, take classes at places like the Southside Innovation Center, attend networking events at places like um, the Wise Women's Business Center. So fast forward to um, 2017, which is three years ago, position out of the university um, by way of unit being downsized. I'll spare your audience of the full story other than to say that this um, amazing company um, based in the Washington DC area called Event Prep, I guess we found each other, so to speak, and the, the irony, Jen, is the, the base of event prep has to do with sourcing, procuring, and contracting hotel venues all over the U U.S. for organizations that um, need such a space for their, their groups. And that was just one of the things I did in my day job. Three years ago, I actually made history by becoming the first um, owner of the event prep brand in New York State. And, uh, and so now I'm just gonna bring it up to last year. Um, pretty much um, first quarter of last year, uh, Event Prep has successfully launched and Syracuse is still um, ranked um, high in terms of concentrated poverty in the nation. Mm -hmm. For me to go ahead and realize a dream, mm -hmm. that dream was to produce Syracuse's first ever financial empowerment summit. And, uh, and that brings us to this year. Um, uh, in March of this year, I was ready to hit launch on that April. 
and then COVID. Yes. So when I met you back in, I think it was January or February of 2020, you were really excited about the financial summit and I saw all of the work that you did and it was very, I mean, there was so much that, that was going into this. You had such a passion for it. And on top of being the interim director of UMA and running your business, you now have this extra thing. Can you talk about what your vision was for the summit, for the Financial Literacy Summit? Certainly, I remember that day uh, very fondly meeting you. You were a, a ray of light and you, like many people, just simply you know, said, what can I do? Which was part of what um, energized me. Um, I did in fact have a, a vision. Um, I thought the time was ripe and the uh, fruit was low hanging enough yeah. to um, embark upon this long time dream uh, that I had but um, it, had, it had to be in its own time. The, the vision was to bring together diverse community collaboration under one roof. Syracuse is really blessed with um, individuals with golden hearts, um, a plethora of social and human service organizations that are um, serving um, the most needy in our community and resources abound. And I thought, all right, so, you know, what if we brought all of these um, resources together under one roof and um, enjoyed an all-day conference teaching people on um, the basics of money and finances? And the last thing I guess I'll say is that the topics were dissected to reach targeted groups. So if you are low to moderate income, there were tracks specifically designed to meet your needs. Um, also, um, college students, we, you know, no conference worth this salt would have been able to skirt the topic of student loans um, in that regard. And so we had, um, if I remember from the promo book it, booklet, 11 or 12 affinity groups mm -hmm. where financial literacy was to be customized toward their group. So I want everybody listening to think about the, the enormity of planning that, your vision, bringing it to life. And then I want them to think about the enormity of running an events planning business where you have a lot of balls in the air all of the time. And then the enormity of being the interim director of UMEA. And not only the enormity of it, but the, um, the amount of energy that it takes to do the, those kinds of jobs and how busy your life was. We have all been there. And you're just such a I love how honest you were in our conversation last week when we were talking about doing this interview where you said, where I said, you know, do you have something that we could bring to people to help them feel centered? And you said, I don't think you're going to like what I have to say, <laughs> but I loved what you said. And so I feel like this moment where you had everything just so ripe and ready to go and you had put all of your energy and time behind it. And then COVID happens and it kind of stops everything in its tracks. And you have just had this gigantic epiphany for your life. And I just, I, I can't wait to hear you talk about this. Certainly. Well, in order to answer where things are now, I have to kind of paint a picture of where things were. And the picture that's coming to mind, Jen, is um, remember when we, we would go to the, the fair and there is this game, there is this uh, game that was always my favorite. It's the heads that popped up and you had to take the hammer and hit the head. And as soon as you hit what was it called? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole, yes. And as soon as you hit one head, another popped up. Well, that pretty much described my life pre-COVID-19. So this time last year was the genesis of planning the Financial Empowerment Summit. I had told myself, you know, once you sign that hotel contract, there's no turning back. It's, it's on. Right. So that was um, ramping up. Mm -hmm. Then I um, inherited this role with Umia, mm -hmm. so that changed my world. Um, and, and event prep was in full launch. So this is what my daily looked like. Pretty much um, my day was jammed with meetings um, by day, sometimes events by night. So even though I've been working from home for the past three years, I had to arrange my schedule such that by the time I, you know, got out the house, you have to, so I'm going to keep it real here for a second. You have to drive to the meetings, park, be a few minutes early before the meetings, attend the meetings, chit chat before and after the meetings. And then, and I had successive meetings. So I had to, to work extra hard to make sure I ate lunch in between 
And then by the conclusion of the day, if I didn't go off to an event somewhere, um, I had to fetch and figure out what was going to be for dinner. Most of the time, um, it was uh, carry out mm -hmm. uh, way more times than I care to admit, particularly as a financial educator. Um, and then I would come home to a pile of emails, emails that piled up on top of me while I was at all of these meetings, because, you know, you want to be 100% engaged and not be, you know, I don't, didn't want to be on my phone trying to manage emails during a meeting. Um, and, and that's just my style. So I would be curating emails well into the midnight hour and make sure that certain emails were sent the next morning before I started the cycle all over again. And then a quick word about weekends. Weekends were spent crashing from the previous week and just trying to recuperate from the previous week. Um, but I had what I call Sunday blues and Sunday anxiety because Sunday, unfortunately, um, also, you know, like a a after church, <laughs> it was, it was about, okay, what do I need to do to get advance on Monday before the Monday blues hits? Because if I don't, something's going to bite me on Monday. Yes. That, that was, that was my voluminous life pre COVID-19. I think that anybody listening can really identify with what you're talking about because um, it, it's just, it was just, it was go, 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 which is why it was so hard for us when it, when it slammed to a stop. So as an extrovert for me, I used to believe that that filled me up and now that I haven't been doing it. I've found that I was telling myself a lie all along. Like I don't need to be in the company of that many people. I don't need to go to that many meetings. I don't need to have that much filling up my life. So I had, I have had to find different things to fill up my energy, but for introverts, that kind of life is even more exhausting because you never get the break to recharge for yourselves. Absolutely. And when I was in that um, hamster wheel, I knew cognitively that um, the volume was consuming me, but I didn't know how to stop it. Like <laughs> even when I assessed, okay, Mache, what are you involved in and why are you involved in it? everything I was involved in made, made sense. It was, it was leading somewhere. It was making a difference, doing something. Um, but at the same time, I didn't know how to get out of that cycle. Right. So I love this, 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 I love where we're going here because really what you, the, the world kind of said no to us, the world said stop. Right. And so we did. And then the sense that I've gotten is we've all had to, within these three or four months that we've been stopping, um, decide, well, what do we want to continue to say no to as we get back to this new normal? So I'm curious, what have you decided is your new normal? Well, I have decided that uh, I, to a great extent, I can't go back to what was. So when everything came to a screeching and grinding halt, um, you know, mid-March, I guess that would be June, no, that was three, night, three months now, life changed drastically. And this is the part I said to you privately that I'll say publicly. Um, I've even been a little coy uh, to say, and then, but I'm now more comfortable to say for the better. So we can all agree that COVID-19, the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic is horrible. Uh, that's without dispute. Mm -hmm. But the effect, the net effect on my own personal life has actually been amazing. So um, you heard what I described to you in terms of how life was before. Now I, um, I wake up and, um, and, and as a woman of faith, um, you know, have my devotions in the morning and just get, you know, centered. Mm -hmm. um, I take walks in the neighborhood, um, which also, you know, serves as my, as my exercise. And I can't tell you how, uh, well, you know, how the, the fresh air just filling my lungs in the morning as the sun is peeking through the trees, how um, serene that is. So my days are getting started off a lot differently. If I can help it, I try not to take meetings before 10 a.m., 10, 10.30 in the morning. 
Um, obviously, if it's a group meeting that's unavoidable, I'll acquiesce. But um, if I can help it, I try to protect that time. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I am on, like I am now, it, you yeah. know, let's let's do it. Um, other ways it's affected my life, Jen, is I'm downright embarrassed to admit how much we ate out. <laughs> us too. The house, don't get me started. Um, the house is clean, decluttered, organized, la laundry's getting done a lot more frequently. And the last thing I want to say has to do with, with consumption. Mm. And this is where I'll put my financial literacy hat back on a bit. But our consumption dropped drastically. And when I say drastically, I mean the only things we bought were groceries. We didn't even have to fill up our vehicles with gas because we weren't going anywhere. We didn't have to, you know, go shopping for clothes because we were dressing casual every day. Like literally when I think about it, we we only brought groceries and here's the amazing thing about that. We already had our needs. It made me think, well, what was it that we were buying before? What kind of consumerism were we engaged in before? If apart from food, you know, food and, and, and shelter, if our basic needs and everything we have, you know, we live comfortably, if we already have what we need and many of our wants and desires are right here, what were we doing before? These are some examples of, of the drastic changes made in my life. And I guess the other thing I'll add here is, you know, relationships. Um, yes, meetings change because of Zoom. But I think that having Zoom has helped me to increase my productivity. Mm -hmm. Because after I do, I finish Zoom, I can just walk steps away and fix lunch instead of having to go fetch lunch. It's helped me to, you know, connect more with my husband and my family. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to send old fashioned cards in the mail. I remember a point um, in all that busyness where my siblings were like, where are you? We, we want to talk to you. How are you doing? But like I said, I was doing the Monday through Friday and then crashing weekends and didn't really want to engage weekends. So now, um, now, now my siblings can't get rid of me. <laughs> Your story is so relatable and I really appreciate you sharing it because I know this is private stuff, but I don't think that you're abnormal. And I have done very similar things in not taking meetings or not starting work before 10 at this point. And I used to like, uh, rearrange my schedule to, to go to an eight o'clock meeting or a nine o'clock meeting. And, and I don't want to, like, I've just decided I don't want to do that anymore. If I have to let go of some things, I will let go of some things. And I know that not everybody has that, but as entrepreneurs, we have the ability to do that. And I wonder if, as the world is kind of starting to come back into real life, are you starting to see places where the old creep is happening, where old expectations are starting to happen? To, to, to your life and you're going to have to like have that hard line in the sand for yourself? Certainly. I, um, I am committed to maintaining control over my schedule. I, I don't, so as, as someone who is highly adept at micromanaging herself, I micromanage myself to death, um, as it were. Um, I, I don't like um, external factors yanking my chain. And so I um, am trying to maintain a, um, a retain, now that I've gotten it back, retain a greater sense of control over my schedule as well as my, my workflow. Um, I've also learned to be comfortable in my own skin. I, I, I here at, at the age of 52, I don't mind admitting that, I have a very strong sense of how I operate. And Jen, I think this piece actually came a year ago. Um, you know, when you, when you alluded to the fact that I'm juggling all these balls, I actually had to make peace with myself a year ago that this is who I am. This is how I work. It's just that I was trying to operate within, within a um, highly voluminous framework. Mm -hmm. But here a year later, I'm still adapting many of those same principles in order to increase my productivity but I'm doing it on my own terms. Yeah, I love that so much. Thank you for sharing your story with us. 
I'm wondering if you can share, given, um, I'd love for people doing these interviews to tell us about their businesses because I meet so many women who have really amazing businesses and, and different businesses than different business models than I have. How has your business changed given that everything is kind of shut down and where do you see yourself headed in the next six months with event prep? Certainly. Um, you, you said what I was thinking because as you were talking, I was wondering, wow, should I address this from the perspective of just the basics financial literacy or event prep? But um, so yes, um, I'll just talk a little bit about event prep. So the special events and hospitality industry, um, without a doubt, um, has been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Client work dried up mm -hmm. um, in, on the event planning side of the fence. And then, of course, clients that I source and procure hotel venues for, you know, throughout the U.S., that came to a grinding halt as well. However, that was still good for me, even though the revenue suddenly stopped. I took that as an opportunity to reconnect with my clients. It's one thing to send emails trying to get business done. It's another to check in and just say, how are you, mm -hmm. right? So I wanted my clients to know that I care about them. The second thing that I did was actually deepen capacity within event prep. I, I've been, when it comes to event planning, I've always been the project manager, so to speak. I maintain the closest tie to the client and I project manage and I have a team who, who is very um, specialized and adept at what they do. However, I actually took the time to continue to attract top talent. There's one person, who, um, in, in addition, I made to my team who is highly proficient in celebrity procurement. Oh. And that was a particular need that that particular client had. So I onboarded her. And then there's another um, person who um, actually lost their decades old job in the midst of COVID-19. And uh, she has the goods. And so I'm in the process of um, recruiting and onboarding her as well. And why do I say that? Because Jen, as I um, deepen team capacity, it allows me to continue to be nimble um, in order to, um, to manage and execute the other hats that I wear. Yeah, I think that's a lot of, um, uh, most entrepreneurs, especially solo, get to this point where they understand they can no longer do everything and it's really scary to bring on a team members. But once you bring on the team members, you get the freedom that you've been craving for so long. Yeah. Absolutely. I love your story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, is there anything you'd like the audience to know, like one last thing you'd like to suggest to people as they are reevaluating? I'm hearing you developed the relationship with yourself and you also took the time to develop relationships with others and that that has really made all the difference for you in staying in a peaceful, centered place throughout this. Is there anything else that people should know as they try to recenter themselves? Certainly. Um, I would just say continue to know um, and be and be true to who you are, um, particularly your, your work skills and habits, honor that. Um, but I would also say during this COVID-19 pandemic, just as the virus is horrible, um, you know, this pandemic has wreaked havoc on our economy. So I'm sure, you know, many people are struggling financially as well. Try to take advantage of the the opposite, the, you know, the other effect of that, the other net effect, which is, you know, we're on the um, cusp of summer here. Um, we're winding down spring and entering into summer months. Um, perhaps, you know, we have more time on our hands and we've actually seen it. We've seen it through TikTok and, you know, where people are um, enjoying their, their home life more. They're enjoying each other more. They're, they're um, hu hugging their, their loved ones more. I, didn't mean to end on, on a sad note, and, and I promised to bring it up again, but, um, you know, uh, my husband was upstairs watching a, um, you know, a, a funeral on Facebook Live, um, his mother's dear, dear friend, mm -hmm. and I, I commented, I said, wow, this is the age we're in now where funerals are streaming live because of what is going on in life. Yes. And um, it's just, it's just, it's just very sad. So that's why those of us, you know, still here in the land of living, treasure each other, honor each other, yes, I love each that. other. 
I love that ending. It's so like inspiring. If you're here still living, live. You know, I love, I love that perspective. What everything that you're talking about requires mind management. And if you're as exhausted as we were and you were bef in the before times, which is what I call them, um, we didn't have time for the kind of devotional that you're doing in the morning or, or meditating that I'm doing in the morning. We didn't have time to fill ourselves up. And so I love this perspective that you're saying, please take the time to fill yourself up and have some boundaries around what you will put up with and what you won't put up with. I love Absolutely. It. Yes. Mm -hmm. Miche, thank you so much for your insights and for sharing your story with us. And I loved this conversation. I, I, always, I always enjoy talking to you because I always learn something. And we were kind of joking around in the beginning of our conversation. Miche is such a beautifully measured thinker. And I'm such a kind of, I always feel like a sprinkler. And so I always wish like, I could be more like Miche. And so I just, I always love being around an energy like her. So thank you again, Miche. Right. And, and, and just to balance it out for your audience, I, in turn, um, um, I was, you know, advocating for an exchange. Jen, Jen has characteristics that I, I don't. Um, and, but Jen, I do want to thank you for helping me, helping this introspective, introverted um, individual to feel at ease this morning. Thank you. We're here. Thanks, Michelle. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>